I trusted the Lord Jesus 50 years ago. I knew I was a sinner. I heard the gospel that Christ had died on the cross for my sins. And did in simple faith in the quietness of my own bedroom, I, I trusted him. But I stepped into a broad place, as the psalmist says. Doctor Who, as a boy, I remember watching him and his time machine, which was uh, called the TARDIS. And those in the UK will know it was a, an old police box, a meter by a meter by a meter by a meter. And um, the amazing thing is with the TARDIS is that when you open the door, this ordinary looking police box, you stepped into something that was really, really spacious. To me, that's a picture of Christianity. I, uh, as a in simple childlike faith, I made that commit, commitment to Christ at the age of 23, 50 years ago. And I stepped into a broad place, a big place. And tonight we'll catch just a little glimpse of how big it is. So here goes. It's all in PowerPoint. Time passes quickly, doesn't it? And the minutes fly by. And before you know it, it's 10 o'clock. And I've just changed the title slightly. I've called it, There's Time in the Millennium. The word millennium, from the Latin word, mille and uh, anium, mille meaning thousand, and anos meaning years. So millennium simply means a thousand years. There are three major views concerning the millennium as presented in the Bible. And they would be post-millennialism, amillennialism, and pre-millennialism. We're going to consider two of them tonight. Post-millennialism, not tonight, perhaps another night, we're going to look at amillennialism and pre-millennialism. They're very big words, but let's break it up. Amillennialism, you notice you have the word uh, millennium is fairly straightforward, but you notice the letter A. In the Greek language, a word can be turned into a negative by placing the letter A in front of it. An example in our language, you have the word theist. If you put the letter A in front of it, it becomes atheist. And so it's the opposite. So a millennialism would say no millennium. And I'm going to quote a lot tonight from this man here, Anthony Hokima. He is an amillennialist. And uh, he says the term amillennialism is not a happy one. It suggests that the amillennialists either do not believe in any millennium or that they simply ignore the first six verses of Revelation chapter 20, which speaks of a millennial reign. It is an unfortunate term, no millennium. He said neither of these two statements is true. Though it is true that amillennialists do not believe in a literal thousand-year earthly reign, which will follow the return of Christ, the term amillennialism is not an accurate description of their view. So Mr. Hokima and his friends, they do not believe in a literal 1000 year earthly reign of Christ following his return. He goes on to say that amillennialists believe that the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 is not exclusively future but is now in process of realization. Now, just to weigh those words up carefully, amillennialists believe that the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 is not exclusively future, but is now in process of realization. More on this. As far as the thousand years of the Revelation chapter 20 are concerned, we are in the millennium now. 
So the amillennialist, such as Anthony Hokima here, and we're going to see uh, another man called William Hendrickson soon. We are in, we're experiencing the millennium now. Christ is reigning now. And you and I, everybody on planet Earth, we are in the millennium now, according to their scheme of prophecy. William Hendrickson, a man well known for his uh, Bible commentaries, his volume on Revelation is called More Than Conquerors. And on page 227, he wrote, The glories of the millennial age in which we are now living. So according to Hendrickson, we are in the millennium now. We are enjoying the millennial reign of Christ now. This is the scheme of the amillennialists. We are in the millennium now. Any more advice for us, William? So cheer up. We're in the millennium now. Premillennialism, easy to understand. Pre means before. In other words, Christ is going to come before the millennial kingdom is set up. He is coming to set up that kingdom. This will be my uh, way of looking at uh, scripture. Jesus Christ will return dramatically to the earth, an event known as the second coming. He will end the great tribulation and deliver Israel from her enemies. He will be crowned king on Mount Zion, from where he will establish his global kingdom and usher in the millennium. So he's coming before he sets up the millennial kingdom, pre-millennialism. In millennialism, I could draw it out uh, diagrammatically like this. The amillennialist believes that Satan is bound. Power on. And he was bound during the ministry of Christ and following his death and resurrection. We're in the millennium now. Christ is presently reigning upon the throne of David in heaven. So we're in the millennium now according to the air millennialist. Christ returns. Revelation chapter 19, Matthew chapter 25, you have the resurrection of saved and unsaved. You have the judgment of saved and unsaved. The great white throne judgment, the last assize. And that is followed by the eternal state. So that is showing air millennialism uh, graphically. And this diagram here. On the other hand, I would subscribe to this view. Following the cross and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we enter the church age. The gospel is going into all the world, and God is calling out people from Jews and Gentiles to be to form the body of Christ. This work has been going on for two thousand years now, but the day will come when the Lord Jesus Christ will descend from heaven. And we have the rapture of the church, the snatching away of the church. But life will go on on planet Earth. In particular, we enter a period known as Daniel's 70th week. Based on Daniel chapter 9. And we enter a seven year period. Tribulation. At the end of which Christ returns to Earth. Rescues Israel, delivers Israel. The Redeemer shall come to Zion. Satan is bound at this point. The millennial kingdom of Christ begins, crowned on Zion's holy hill, according to Psalm 2. And he reigns for a thousand years. Literal years. A thousand literal year reign of Christ upon planet Earth. After which Satan will be loosed from the abyss. You have the final rebellion. And of course, uh, we, we know who, who wins. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. And the eternal state begins. The new heaven and a new earth. So basically, we have these two, these two different schemes. 
set out like this. You can see that there is a difference. I've heard it put this way, very simply. The difference between these two schemes is that in amillennialism, he reigns before he returns. But in premillennialism, he returns before he reigns. Now, that's an easy way to remember it. So according to the amillennialists, we're in the millennium now. Christ returns and we start the eternal state following that return. Anthony Hokima, in his book on, on Revelation, Behold, He Cometh, he says, and thus we have arrived once more at the very end of all history. When Christ returns, we've arrived once more at the very end of all history. It is at this moment that all the powers of iniquity are vanquished. So at this point in time, history ends. In the words of Hukima, we have come to the very end of all history. It is at this moment that Antichrist and all his hosts perish, that the heavens and the earth are set afire in order to make room for the new heavens and the new earth that are to come. It is the end of this dispensation to be followed by nothing else than the eternal glory in the new creation. Nothing shall take place in history after this. Nothing shall take place in history after this. Nothing. Well, we're going to read some verses from Re Revelation chapter 19. These verses deal with the coming of Christ, his second coming uh, to earth. We'll consider some verses from this chapter. I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So here's the Lord on the white horse, called Faithful and True. He is called Faithful and True. We read, out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. So the beast and all the kings of the earth unite in opposition to the Lord uh, sitting upon this white horse. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. There's no great white throne for these two individuals. They are thrown instantly at the coming of Christ into the lake of fire. And so ends Revelation chapter 19. Now remember what Hokima said. He said that at the return of Jesus Christ, nothing shall take place in history after this. But my friend, friend uh, Ginger there, he says, but what about chapter 20? You see, Revelation 19 finishes with these both, both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Then immediately in Revelation chapter 20, we read, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, into the abyss, 
shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So in Revelation chapter 19, we've had the Lord Jesus returning, dealing with the beast and the false prophet, casting them into the lake of fire. And then Revelation continues with the binding of Satan, the sealing of him in the abyss, that he might deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were completed. And after that, after the thousand years, he must be loosed for a little season. Verse 4, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations, to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. This amazes me, really. After a thousand year reign of Christ, living in a, 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 a paradise earth, a creation restored, that he is able to amass, he is um, a, a, able to gather together a number of rebels, and their number would be as the sand of the sea. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, in his uh, article, A Millennialism, it's available online, Anthony writes, The premillennial interpretation of these verses sees them as describing a millennial reign of Christ on earth, which will occur after his second coming. So as I read Revelation chapter 19, I see the Lord coming. He deals with the beast and the false prophet. Uh, and then we go straight into chapter 20, and we find that Satan is bound. And then you, you have the thousand-year reign of Christ uh, mentioned uh, six times over in six consecutive uh, verses. And so the impression is, is that these two chapters are chronological. They follow uh, 20 follows hard on the heels of chapter 19. And it is true, says Anthony Hukima, that the second coming of Christ has been referred to in the previous chapter, chapter 19. He admits that. He, he cannot help but admit it, that in chapter, chapter 19, the second coming of Christ has been dealt with. If then one thinks of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 15, as describing what follows chronologically, after what is described in chapter 19, verses 1 to 21, one would indeed conclude that the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 will come after the return of Christ. So Anthony is admitting that chronologically, if, if chapter 20 is going to follow chronologically on hard on the heels of chapter 19, then the millennium will come after the return of Christ. Christ. Chronologically indicates, says Anthony, the millennium will come after the return of Christ. Anthony, is that what you believe? Do you believe the millennium will follow the return of Christ? No. The amillennialist does not believe that chapter 20 follows chronologically from chapter 19. No millennium there. Because we're in the millennium now. Christ returns to end the millennium. So we're in the millennium now. But Anthony, my friend Ginger, he's got a problem here. My friend, he says, when I read my Bible, Anthony, Christ is said to rule with a rod of iron. And we're in the millennium now. And Christ is ruling presently with a rod of iron. He 
he has another volume called The Bible and the Future. I've had to invest in a few books for this meeting. He says, chapters 20 to 22 do not describe what follows the return of Christ. So chapter 20, according to the amillennialist, does not follow chronologically chapter 19. So the binding of Satan does not follow the casting of the beast and the false prophet at the end of chapter 19 into the lake of fire. It does not follow in sequence. Well, Anthony, the binding of Satan happens in Revelation chapter 20. Rather, Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 takes us back once again to the beginning of the New Testament era. So the amillennialist, he says that when you get to the end of chapter 19 and the second coming of Christ and the beast and the false prophet are dealt with, he says then when we get to chapter 20, no, 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 John is taking us back to the beginning of the New Testament era, to the ministry of Christ. Is there any indication that Satan was bound at the time of the first coming of Christ? Indeed, there is. When the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan, Jesus replied, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Who is the strong man? Satan. Who are his goods? Those men and women under his sway. And uh, who is the one who binds the strong man? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ in the healing of the man uh, who was, was blind and, and demon uh, possessed. So this is what they say, that the binding of Satan happened uh, during the Lord's ministry. And then, of course, he'll take us into Hebrews chapter 2, that by death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might set free all those who through, through fear of death, the whole of their lifetime, was subject to bondage. The binding of Satan described in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, therefore means that throughout the gospel age, right now, the Power influence, on. the influence Power on. on the influence, though certainly not annihilated, is so curtailed that he cannot prevent the spread of the gospel to the nations of the world. And please look at that. I want you to make a note of that last phrase there. They admit that the influence of Satan is not, he's not annihilated. He is still present. In fact, he's described as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. But what they do say is that his power is limited. And he cannot prevent the spread of the gospel to the nations of the world. Now, when Satan is bound in Revelation chapter 20, it doesn't say that. He is bound that he might deceive the nations no more. What does the scripture say? Well, I've told you. The angel bound him a thousand years and cast him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him that he should not any more deceive the nations until. In Revelation chapter 20, it is stated specifically, nothing to do with the spread of the gospel, but that he should deceive the nations no more until. So for a thousand years, Satan will be unable to carry out his deceptive work on the nations as he's been doing for these millennia today. It is the end of this dispensation to be followed by nothing else than the eternal glory and the new creation. Once Christ comes, the second coming of Christ, it's the end of this dispensation to be followed only by eternity. Nothing takes place in history after this. Well, where are you, where are you going with this? The, the the bottom uh, writing there, Michael Vlack. I listened to a sermon by Michael Vlack. Uh, I'll give you a reference to it uh, later on 
in the course of the address. And it was what Michael Vlack said in the course of the sermon that set me off on this meeting tonight. And he quoted this man, Wayne Grudem. And Wayne Grudem said in his book, Systematic Theology, several Old Testament passages seem to fit neither in the present age nor in the eternal state. So when Mr. Grudem read his Old Testament, New Testament, there were passages there that couldn't relate to the present. But he knew also that they couldn't relate, for reasons we shall come into later on, to the eternal state. It was a mystery. These passages indicate some future stage in the history of redemption, which is far greater than the present church age, but which still does not see the removal of all sin and rebellion and death from the earth. I'll read that again. The passages that Gruden was concerned about indicated some future stage in the history of redemption, which is greater than the present church age, but which still does not see the removal of all sin and rebellion and death from the earth. Because I know the scriptures that he's thinking about, Isaiah, we maybe get a chance to look at those. And, and he realizes that it, it can't be eternity because we have death and sin. And yet, and yet there are circumstances mentioned in these prophecies that don't relate to the present time. What's it all about? Well, Hukima says, the millennium of the premillennialists, therefore, is something of a theological anomaly. It is, to be sure, better than the present age, but it falls far short of being the final state of perfection, the eternal state. So Grudem and Hokima admit that in the reading of Scripture, there are prophecies that exceed the present, but fall short of the eternal. And there's Michael Vlack. Now, PRTRC, it's the Pre-Trib Research Center. There's so much material available on this website. I heartily recommend it, as I would do the a Prophetic Witness website. The Pre-Trib Research Center, they have hundreds of sermons in written form, some in video form, and many in audio form. And I downloaded one of Michael Black's uh, sermons, and as I was out walking, I was listening to him preaching, and it was this man here who sparked the idea for tonight's uh, message. He said, there are yet many unfulfilled prophecies, and the future millennium gives the time and opportunity for these prophecies to come to pass before the eternal state. There are many unfulfilled prophecies. Well, when are these prophecies going to be fulfilled? Because according to the amillennialist, when Christ does come back to planet Earth, in terms of history, there is no more history. History is finished. There is nothing to follow. But we have so many unfulfilled prophecies. The future millennium gives the time and the opportunity for these prophecies to come to pass before the eternal state. So that's why I've chosen the title, There's Time in the Millennium. The millennium affords the time for these multitude of prophecies to be fulfilled. Just a reminder, the Amil scheme, Christ returns. 
Nothing shall take place in history after this. We enter into the eternal state. The pre-mill, in contrast, you've got the church age, you've got the rapture of the church, you've got the seven-year period of tribulation, Christ returns to planet Earth, he sets up his thousand-year kingdom, and after that, we have the eternal state. And whereas the amillennialist will say that once Christ returns, nothing takes place in history after this, the premillennialist would say, much will take place in history after this. And it's during the millennium that the scores of yet unfulfilled Bible prophecies will come to pass because there's time in the millennium. You know, when I heard Michael Vlack say this, as I was walking around uh, uh, in the locality here, and just listening to the sermon, I was saying to myself, Ian, you must be thick. Why didn't you see this before? It's right in front of your eyes. There are certain prophecies that must yet be fulfilled. And everything that God says will come to pass, but when are they going to be fulfilled? When the millennium affords us the time for these things to be fulfilled. We will now consider 13 topics in scripture that would indicate that time is required for certain prophetic events to take place following the Lord's return. So we're going to look at 13 topics, not tonight. I don't know how far we'll get tonight. That clock, oh, we're running out of time, aren't we? We need some millennial time here. And we will now consider 13 topics in scripture that would indicate that time is required for certain prophetic events to take place following the Lord's return to earth. The millennium gives the required time. And if, if as a premillennialist, I can prove conclusively that the amillennialist position, that nothing will take place in history after his return, if I can prove that that, that thesis is wrong, then the prophetic scheme adopted by the pre-mills, a literal 1,000-year reign, affords ample time for these scriptures to be fulfilled. First one. First of 13. We won't get far tonight, but here's number one. Zechariah chapter 14. Now, if I was to ask you, when the Lord Jesus ascended back to heaven, where did he leave from? He left from the Mount of Olives. And the words of the angels were that this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Well, Zechariah chapter 14. God says, I will gather, I will gather, Jehovah who is gathering, all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, returning to the place from which he ascended, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and towards the west. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. So we've got some scriptures here that are yet to be fulfilled. Verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. King over all the earth. Psalm 72, 
it's not strictly speaking a messianic psalm, but even William Hendrickson is going to admit it is a messianic psalm. It deals with the Messiah. It goes well beyond Solomon. It says of this coming king, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. He shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee, this king, as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. This indicates time, does it not? So the king has come, and here we have a period of time. These people are going to fear the king as long as the sun and moon endure. Throughout all generations, Mr. Darby translates from generation to generation. So this king who will judge the poor of the people and save the children of the needy and break in pieces the oppressor, this king whom they will fear, will, will, will be feared as long as the sun and moon endure and will be feared from generation to generation. In his days, the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. In his days. So this coming king has a period of days. And during those days, during the, the, his righteous reign, there will be peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Global dominion this king has. It, it goes way beyond Solomon. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So the very word serve indicates the passing of time. So this king who comes will be feared from generation to generation. And, and this king who comes, well, all nations shall serve him. There is a period of time involved. And prayer also shall be made for him continually. And daily shall he be praised. Notice, prayer made for him continually. And daily shall he be praised. We're dealing with time. This king, who will have global dominion, there are time periods marked in his reign, be it prayer or be it service. And there shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like ne Lebanon. I don't see many farmers sowing wheat on the top of Scarfell Pike there in the Lake District. But in the reign of this king, things are going to be different. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. And the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon. Fruitfulness under the reign of uh, this king. But tell me, tell me, if you're going to sow and to reap, well, that requires time. So this coming king, whom all nations are going to serve, and to whom prayer is going to be made continually, daily, well, in his reign, there'll be fruitfulness, but you have to sow seed to, 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 gather, to gather a harvest. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him, and all nations shall call him blessed. This is the big place that God has brought us into that I mentioned at the start of the meeting. He's brought you and me into this big place. And we know him who is the coming king. And all nations shall call him blessed. But the amillennialist says we're in the millennium now. Do we observe all nations calling him blessed? I suggest you get out onto the street and try and preach the gospel. And you'll find there that oh, you just have to mention the name of Jesus to the passers-by and the, the hackles go up and the opposition starts. Hmm? All nations saying, blessed Lord Jesus. Yet all kings shall fall down before him. 
King Charles the Third falling down before him. Well, he's the man not of not the protector of the faith, but the prote protector of faith, as it describes himself. All kings falling down before him. Is that what we see today? All nations all serving him. Mr. Hendrickson again, more than conquerors, page 227. He says, the glories of the millennial age in which we are now living. Truly, the prophecy found in Psalm 72 is being fulfilled before our very eyes. So well, William Hendrickson, he admits that Psalm 72 is speaking about someone greater than Solomon, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we find written in that lovely psalm, Hendrickson says, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. Yes, all kings falling down before him and all nations serving him. All nations. Iran falling down before him. Sadly, what about the UK today? What a heritage we have, the works of the, the likes of William Tyndale, who gave his life that the ploughboy might have a copy of the scriptures in his own language, his mother tongue. Look at the UK today. You could offer them a free copy of the scriptures and very few would take it. Some would even spit in your face. But in this period, when the king reigns and there's abundance of corn upon the, upon the earth, upon the tops of the mountains, when all nations will serve him, that has to be in the time period of the millennial kingdom. So I'm going to go back to Zechariah chapter 14 now on the same theme. We're still in number one. It shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem. So living waters stemming out from Jerusalem. Half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the Hinder Sea, the Mediterranean uh, and the Dead Sea. In summer and in winter, it shall be. So we've got the passage of time there. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. But it doesn't finish there. It shall come to pass. Don't forget, this is the one who's touched down on the Mount of Olives to deliver those people in Jerusalem. It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Did you spot it? Did you spot it? From year to year? So this king has come. He's delivered Israel. He's delivered Jerusalem. The, the, the deliverer, to quote uh, Romans 11, has come to Zion. And the nations that remain will be compelled to go up to Jerusalem year by year by year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. If they don't, there's a punishment waiting for them. Now, when is this going to take place? I don't know. This is, this is perhaps the, the anomaly that uh, Hokima was talking about, that uh, it's, it's a mystery. Well, to what period? Not the church age, the water stemming out from Jerusalem uh, and, and the eternal state. What is this period of which the prophet is speaking? Well, I believe the answer is the millennium is the time when these things will happen because there's time in the millennium. But according to the amillennialist scheme that once the Lord Jesus returns in terms of history, nothing else will happen afterwards. So what are we going to do with these prophecies? Put them in the bin? God is not different to his word. He keeps his word. Now, I, I think my time is gone. So I think I might have to leave it there. Uh, David, because I know you have to sing a hymn and uh, I, I've got to uh, close in prayer. So I'm just, David, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. I didn't get as far as I hoped I would get uh, this evening. So I shall uh, just leave it. I'm just going to pray. And then we'll hand over to, to David. Father, as the psalmist would say, 
we've been brought into a broad place. How wonderful to think that he's lifted our feet from the miry clay. He set our feet upon a rock, established our goings, put a new song into our mouth, even praise to thee, our God. We have every reason to praise thee. Praise thee for Calvary. Praise thee for the empty tomb. Praise thee for the promise of his coming and for that bright prospect that if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. So may thy word have been insightful, may it have been helpful to the people who've been on the Zoom meeting tonight and help us to cut a straight path through the word of God, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we thank thee for fellowship tonight in thy word, returning thanks in the Saviour's precious name. Amen.